an Institute of Innovation and Technology flagship research project. So welcome to Chris. Thanks for joining us. And we also have Yanis or Jan, John uh, Stotis, who's the CTO and partner at AgriNow. Uh, I'm not so good at Greek, so apologies for getting the John and Yanis mixed up there. Uh, Janice has been transforming the way food companies ri use risk assessment and risk prediction. And I say he's a partner in the AgriNow company. Uh, Dr. Stotis is an expert in using digital tools for risk assessment of foods. He's worked with several uh, Forbes listed food companies uh, for assessing their ingredients and suppliers and helping them to automate those risks, including the use of artificial intelligence to generate predictive analytics that help companies prevent food safety incidents. Janice also uh, presents a series of videos explaining how to predict food safety incidents for busy people. And as you can see from the, the pictures there on screen, I'm Neil Marshall, the Managing Director of Gov Consulting. Probably most people know me for my 20 plus years working at Coca-Cola. So with that, uh, let's just go step forward and hopefully the screen will respond for me. There we go. So our goal today is try to look at uh, risk assessment and risk prediction using technology and also the expertise of Chris to show how we can help prevent those issues occurring and identify those issues before they happen. Obviously that's the golden triangle that everybody's looking for, but using the software and the system we're gonna to show today and partnering with the intelligence and insights from Chris and, and similar people, we think we have a solution to take us there. So just, Let's just think about the background for a minute. So bearing on research, and I'm sure many people have seen this already, there is generally a low level of trust from consumers in the food safety information that's out there. As Chris can no doubt talk uh, following my brief introduction, you know, there's so much information out there on the internet, but it's probably the least trusted by consumers. The food companies and business operators uh, also have lots of information, probably slightly more trusted, but always there's a bit of suspicion around that. And then probably consumers trust more, more trust of the governments and the regulators. But again, some, some uh, indecision is still there around that information. So as we can see on the right-hand side, you know, the population are worried because there's been so many uh, recalls, risks, food incidents, uh, harming foodborne illness, that over a billion people or 17% of the population say they've experienced or seen or been aware of an incident that's happened from eating food in the last two years. So obviously we want to try and prevent that. And we want to try to uh, find intelligence from the data and science to help us predict those incidents before they happen. That's, that's what we're trying to go towards. But obviously that's difficult and we need to use technology and intelligence to take us there. So why is predict risk prediction and prevention more important than ever before? We need to look at what the industry has said. We need to try to prevent major incidents. We need to be more proactive less reactive. And to use one of my phrases, we need to try to see around corners. So see around corners so we know what's coming, yeah? That's difficult, but that's all about prevention. But we're spending a lot of money in that area already. Companies are spending huge amounts of, uh, of dollars, euros, pounds, wherever you are in the world, on trying to prevent incidents or investigate incidents after they've happened. I'm sure Chris will mention it, but one of the uh, points that Chris is trying to raise is, you know, this can be used better on prediction and pre than prevention. And there's so much data out there now, and hopefully Yanis can show us that with the tool, that we're not using that data efficiently and effectively to help us predict those issues. And ultimately the point, you know, this will make Chris laugh now, <laughs> the point that we're trying to get to with these tools and intelligence and science is to put people like Chris out of a job. 
so that it's not needed anymore. Now, of course, we always want to on the panels and to give us in insights, but the idea is to take us away from prevention, uh, sorry, take us away from reactive uh, responses to being more predictive. So with that, I'll now pass to Dr. Elliot, who will take us through the scientific approach to food safety intelligence. Thank you very much, Neil. <clears throat> Thanks for the introduction. Thanks also for uh, <clears throat> threatening my, my future career. I'm, I'm really appreciative of that. Um, and I, I, you know, I really am grateful for, for the invitation to come and speak at the webinar. Do you know that <clears throat> very, very soon, the world's population is going to reach 8 billion people. It's a new, new landmark, <clears throat> we're, we're getting closer. And the statistic that you showed says that <clears throat> 1 billion people on this planet <clears throat> suffer from foodborne illness in, in a short space of time. That's only going to get worse. It, it, it's just going to get worse. And I'll tell you why. <clears throat> I, I spend a lot of my time studying the world's food supply system. And that's why I've got no hair, okay? It is unbelievably complicated just how we move food from one part of the planet to another. So we, we've really, we've lost touch of how our food is produced, who's producing it and, and, and techniques and so forth. So we have that increasing complexity and with complexity comes lots of issues in terms of people making mistakes. And a lot of food safety incidents are, are about mistakes human error, but what sits behind that? Some of the big drivers of food safety that I spend a lot of time looking at, <clears throat> if, I, if I was to, to produce a list of the things that most worry me about food safety going forward, it's our changing climate. And there's absolutely no doubt about that. <clears throat> because with our changing climate, <clears throat> what will come lots of risks that were never seen before in particular geographic regions or with particular types of, of, of crops, particular types of, of food commodities. There, there, there's, no change, there's no doubt about that. And, and again, I mean, I work really closely with lots of food companies locally, nationally and internationally. And I know how much effort is put in to trying to ensure that the food that we all eat close to 8 billion people is safe to eat. And, and I often congratulate companies in terms of the efforts that they put into trying to ensure food is safe. But it is a changing landscape, it's a changing climate, that's for sure, <clears throat> and, and risks are changing also. And I do, <clears throat> joking apart, spend quite a lot of my time investigating when things have gone wrong. We completed a very large study just a number of months ago to try to understand why hundreds of people became poisoned with food, why some young children died from eating contaminated food. And it was a very complex story, but the main reason was our changing climate because toxic agents got into food that nobody thought would, would ever be there. So things are changing, food safety risks are changing. And I think, again, for a lot of companies, for a lot of businesses, your, your plans, your, your risk management plans are actually based on historical plans because this is what we did last year, this is what we did the year before. So very much based on historical data, not on what's happening now, and equally important, not what's happening in the future. And because of that, I think, uh, uh, as, as Neil referred to, I think a huge amount of money is actually being wasted. So if you've got a, a sampling and testing program and you're showing that 98% or 99% of everything is okay, my, my, my feedback to people is generally, my goodness, aren't you wasting a huge amount of money because you're not actually finding the real food safety risks there. So if you're sitting at this webinar and you look at your last set of data and it was 99% everything's okay, you should be starting to worry. And I think 
we, we do live in the era of big data. I, I mean, I just hear big data day after day after day, big data projects. And you know, there is the expression is information is king and knowledge is power. And we have a huge amount of information available to us. And, and what, what I try to do is gather together different piece, pieces of information. And we try to think about what the big food safety risks might be or big food fraud risks might be. And we go away and investigate that. I, I'm firmly of the belief that the real risks that sit within companies or actually sometimes countries aren't really well known or well understood until it's too late. And recently, actually, in, in working with Agri, no, you know, I've done quite a lot of thinking about it. And what I would love sitting on my desk is a crystal ball. And I call it the digital crystal ball. And if anybody decides to use that, I'm going to trademark it, OK? And if, if I see it in any article, I'm going to sue you, OK? <clears throat> Now, what, what is a digital crystal ball is all of this disparate information coming from lots of different sources, okay? Very complex information. But what the, the art is translating all of that different information, the data, into information and then into intelligence. And that intelligence has to be something that you can read really quickly. It has to be a dashboard-based system. And, and we have striven to do this for quite a number of years in terms of collecting all of this different information. And for several years, I have tried to find what I think are the right technology partners for doing this. Myself and my researchers were very good at, at sampling and testing and doing the analytical uh, uh, chemistry piece, but not the, the intelligence gathering and data interpretation. And that's why I'm, I have really teamed up with, with Agrino on quite a number of projects now. And what I'm hoping now, Janice, you're going to tell us, okay, how does a digital crystal ball work, okay? Sound okay to you? Very happy to do so. Thank you so much, Chris, for the introduction. I think I'm going to steal your word, though. You may have to sue me, Chris. I think I like the digital crystal ball. <laughs> You'll hear from my lawyers. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. But I think just before we go to Yanis, I think uh, we maybe have a poll. But I, I took some points there already, Chris. I particularly like your points around human error. The climate change, I think that's something for people to be really thinking about now in every angle. Yeah? And historical data not being... Uh, future proofed and 98%. Um, there's many companies who are in that position, I think, who think 98% is getting them where they need to be, but they're not. So, and, and information is king, as you say, very, very relevant. So, I think maybe we have a poll to do from, from the side before we just go to Yanis. Yes, there we go. Thank you. So, if you can, uh, the people from the, on, online, if you want to answer and put in your request. Uh, in the in the box, and it will give us a, a feedback, and then we'll transition through to Yanis. I think we've got about a minute. If you can just answer now. Um, am I allowed during that minute need to make a complaint? <clears throat> sure, go on, Chris. Yeah, I'm not allowed to fill in the poll, and I would love. To. <laughs> I think I can do it either. So you, you're not on your own. I think the three of us. It's, it's asking the right questions. It really is. Yeah, and I think this is some of the things that we found as you as you look at the data. You know, there's various different ways to capture data. Different companies are doing it different ways. Uh, many people are still stuck in the Excel spreadsheets approach, but this is just really trying to capture how people are currently capturing their data and analyzing the risks. Okay, I'm not sure if we're gonna show that directly or not, but I think we can go through to Yanis. Oh, well, there we go, we've got the results already. So let's have a look. So 40% is still in Excel as we just predicted, I think. 30% uh, between 
not identifying their risks and not being accurate. 56%, I think I had more being there as well, afraid that unexpected risks will appear in the supply chain that they're not aware of. So hopefully Yanis and maybe Chris afterwards can give us some <laughs> helpful insights there as well. And what else have we got in there? Evidence-based, lack of. So I, I think that's a good segue through to you, Yanis, to give us your insights now on risk assessment and prediction. Great, that, that's a, a very interesting insight uh, from the poll. So just a, a few words about Agrono and what we are doing. So we are the food safety intelligence company that extracts tailor-made data insights for the global supply chain. What we do is that we collect, translate and enrich global food safety data and using the technology that really works, the big data technology that can solve uh, real challenges of the industry, uh, combined with the data, we help the food safety experts working in the food industry to solve the challenges that they have in their everyday work. So this is the main goal of applying the technology, but also the data that uh, all this data that we are collecting and that was mentioned by Chris and Neil. One of such challenges is how to deal with risk assessment. As already mentioned by Neil, risk assessment is still a manual task. It's time consuming and error prone. And uh, when you are busy and you have many things and many worries, it's not, uh, it's not straightforward to deal with the risk as a manual task. Our approach for the risk assessment is based on three steps. The first step is the risk identification. The second step is the risk characterization and ranking. And the third step that goes to the digital crystal ball that uh, Chris mentioned is about risk prediction. So let's go a bit deeper in each of these steps. We, it was one of the results of the poll that uh, the food safety experts are still worried that they will, they will miss very important and emerging risks that may appear in the global food supply chain. Because Food Akai provides access to many different data types, to millions of data records that is collecting from data sources, such as the websites of national authorities, such as the results of uh, pesticide monitoring programs, uh, valid uh, news uh, uh, websites and media websites, we are delivering real-time incidents and alerting for the supply chain that uh, for your supply chain. And this helps to identify emerging hazards for your supply chain. This is something that we will go through during the interactive demo later on. Just some example of such an emerging risk from the, uh, from the recent uh, times. So it was fipronil case in eggs in July, 2017. It was the ethylene oxide case in sesame seeds in September 2020. It was the prochloraz case in mandarins and oranges in November 2020. It is the ethylene oxide in peppercorns in February 2021. I am sure that you are thinking, what are the, the two last ones? Be patient, we will analyze them during the interactive demo. Identifying the risk is the one step, but how can I use the identified risk in order to recalculate and re-rank the risk assessment that I'm doing already with very good approaches and very good tools that I have developed? So the FUDAKAI risk assessment module helps you exactly to do something like that, to automate the risk assessment based on all these food safety incidents that we are collecting from uh, the global supply chain. 
all these data that are announced by different uh, organizations, by, in the, by different sites, how you use all these incidents, you integrate them into the uh, risk assessment tool and automatically how you ranking the risk in order to prioritize the preventive actions that you want to, to activate. So this is exactly what food risk assessment, the food AKI risk assessment is providing. And the food safety experts that we are working with have managed to reduce more than 50% of the time devoted to risk assessment task using the automated risk assessment approach that food AKI is providing. Risk identification and risk assessment are part of the reactive, of a very good reactive strategy. But we hear from the food safety uh, leaders and from all the experts that we are working with that is very important also to predict uh, food safety risks and food fraud risks. Because in this way, they will be able to prevent recalls. So this is why to address this challenge, we have built the Fudakai risk prediction uh, services. It's the live food risk predictions that is based on new risks that are identified that can predict incidents and hazards that are likely uh, to occur. And how we do that in order to build such predictions, uh, we are using something that we call the food safety intelligence question. And this question starts from understanding very well the business problem, the business question. It's based on using the right data, on selecting the right data, selecting the right prediction method, algorithm, and then visualizing, presenting the prediction outcome in a way that is meaningful to the experts and that will help the food safety experts to make informed decisions. Such uh, predictions can help us to answer critical business questions, like for example, which are the specifically, which hazards will increase for a specific ingredients for the, during the next uh, few months. I hear many times the question, if such uh, predictions could really work in order to prevent the food recall. I will mention an example here. I will go again to the case of ethylene oxide in sesame seeds, uh, more than 900 100 recalls and border rejections, more than 150 different products and ingredient types uh, affected, 32 countries affected. Uh, it was found that this chemical was 1000 times larger than the uh, MRL that is uh, uh, that we have in the regulation. So could we really prevent a recall in a finished product that includes sesame seeds? Let's go back to November 1st, and then I would like to go back even uh, a few months uh, before. So in November, there was, there was a real recall for a food company that is selling instant noodles for the unauthorized substance ethylene oxide that was found in one of the ingredients. Guess which? And this was a, a large recall, but what happened in September 2020? What the predictions were telling to, uh, to us in September 2020? Based on the prediction in, in September 2020, it was highlighted that there will be in increase, an important increase, a significant increase of incidents for sesame seeds, more than 140% increase. And it was also highlighted that the ethylene oxide, uh, but also salmonella, but mainly the ethylene oxide will be highly one of the very, on, of, of the emerging and the very increasing risk. So this was explicitly highlighted in the dashboard of global predictions. It was also mentioned which are automatically with no manual work, which are the products, the finished products, but also which suppliers are affected 
by these specific emerging risks. And using such an information, the company could include this parameter in the lab test plan to make sure that there is no such chemical hazards found in the ingredient and in the finished product. Ask suppliers who are using this ingredient to provide certificate of analysis and plan remote audits if needed for suppliers in order to check if they are affected by the emerging risk. So in this way, do you believe that such a recall could be prevented if all these measures were taken uh, into, uh, were activated on September 2020? Let's see how such a digital crystal ball looks like in the interactive demo. So during the interactive demo, we will show you all the services that are uh, provided by Fudakai, but mainly focused on the ones that are uh, in uh, food assessment, that are focused in, uh, to food, uh, uh, food risk assessment. Uh, there are services, as I mentioned, for uh, risk monitoring and risk assessment, services for real-time monitoring and alerting, for hazard analysis, for automated reporting, for supplier evaluation, for automated risk assessment, and for risk prediction. Thank you, Yanis. And I think uh, you could see on the last slide the multiple of different offer off offerings from the Food Akai platform. You know, particularly, we'll be interested to see in the demo. I think about uh, predictive but also the supplier information. Maybe you can touch on that in the demo as well. But I think before that, yeah, we have a poll. Good timing, good reminder for me there. So this time it's from the information you've just seen and just from the demonstration that Yanis just gave. Can you also uh, click in the box and give us a response please for which of the modules you think would be most appropriate for you and most value, valuable? to help you in your jobs to be uh, more informed. So from the overview that Yanis gave, can you give us a response please? And then we'll just review the data. We'll just give you a minute. And then as we prepare uh, for Yanis to do the demo. Uh, there's been a couple of questions in the chat box, which I've answered already. Hopefully I've got the right answer and, and, uh, <laughs> and Yanis won't hit me afterwards. Uh, particularly around the recording, the, the session will be recorded and we apologize if people had some access issues getting into the webinar at the beginning, uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, but hopefully, there we go. So the results are, let's look, global incident monitoring, 49%. Also automating the risk assessment is high on 46, but guess what? Look at the bottom one, risk prediction. Exactly what me and Chris are talking about, risk prediction, predicting the future. That's where we want to go. And I think most of you on the call are in, are in agreement. So that's good to know. Thank you for sharing your insights. And with that, we'll move to the demo, Yanis, to put you under, under pressure really now to show a live demonstration of the capabilities of this fantastic tool. So over to you. It's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to, to demo the platform. So I'll I will try to ask you some questions as we go through, Yanis, to make it a bit interactive for us. Thank you so much, Neil, for making it more interactive. So I will start, and please, at any point, uh, you can interrupt me and ask uh, clarifications and questions. Uh, so uh, with FUDAK platform, as I mentioned, you have, uh, this is a web-based uh, solution. So you have your account, you can enter the, the system uh, and uh, you have access to more than 400,000 food recalls and border rejections that are collected by more than 50 uh, food safety authorities all around the world. In addition to that, uh, you get access to 102 millions of uh, laboratory testing results that are collected and processed from uh, 34 pesticides monitoring programs. 
so it's very important to have all this diverse uh, data, data sources, and to collect, to have access and to identify risks that are announced by all these uh, data sources. But one of the things that we hear a lot is that it's very important to make all this big data, all this information, to make it relevant for my supply chain. I don't know, I don't want to know any risk, but I want to know the risks that are relevant to my supply chain. So for this reason, we have a very good customization part in, in the platform where you can add your ingredients, the ingredients that you want to monitor for emerging and increasing risks, the suppliers that you want to monitor, the finished product for which you want to have automated uh, risk uh, assessment, the suppliers for, for which you want to have automated risk assessments. So when you do that, you will get the um, risk monitoring part that will be tailor-made to your supply chain. So this means that you will get alerts that uh, will be uh, relevant to your supply chain, that will be linked to your ingredients and your suppliers. And also this dashboard that you see here will be uh, focusing on the ingredients, will be showing the incidents for the ingredients that we are interested in, the news for ingredients that you are interested in, and also uh, alerts for suppliers that you have in your supply chain or suppliers in your industry that you want to follow. But the most important thing is how you can identify increasing and emerging risk. So here in the dashboard, you can see that there are the two very important blocks. The one is the increasing issues blocks, where you can see that, for instance, we have a significant increase of incidents uh, during the last period uh, in sesame seeds compared to a previous uh, year, uh, and also a very significant increase in mandarins and oranges. So, if you click on each of these increasing issue, you will get a very good and deep hazard analysis of the last period, of the last 24 uh, months. So you can identify which was the origin country of the, this uh, ingredient that caused the issue. It's India. Which was the main issue? It was a chemical problem. And you can drill down to specific chemical problem, like for instance, uh, it's mainly pesticides and it was the ethylene oxide. So you can get uh, such uh, the system, the platform identifies such an increasing issues for you automatically. You don't need to do anything more than just visiting the dashboard and identifying such increasing issue. But the most important thing is that you have, you can identify uh, the increasing and emerging risk. So in this block of the risk, you can see which are the ingredients that are at a high risk region, at a medium risk region, at a low risk region. The ingredients that we have added all in the customization. So here, well, very fast, in a very fast way, we can see that there is an emerging risk with uh, prochlorzal in mandarins. And you can go, and there is also an increasing risk of aflatoxin in almonds. Uh, and you can go directly and check what this risk is about uh, if you click on the risk analysis part. So what we are doing here is that we are collecting, we are processing all this data and we are applying a, a risk assessment approach that is based on the severity and on the frequency of the hazard specifically now here for the mandarins, but this can be done for thousands of ingredients. And uh, very, in a very fast way, uh, this risk uh, characterization and risk ranking is performed in the uh, system. So it gives you very important information such as that there are the new ones, the new risks are the emerging risk, are the ones that were reported for the first time during the last 10 years for mandarins. And there is an important uh, emerging issue with the use of prochlorzar uh, for in mandarins from uh, Turkey. Uh, but uh, there are also other increasing issues like this chemical, this pesticide, and other uh, emerging issues like the chlorpyrifos, the use of chlorpyrifos in uh, mandarins. 
and the same risk assessment, automated risk assessment, can be performed for other products, for finished products, like for instance, the case of the noodles, where we have some specific ingredients, we can add these ingredients uh, for this product, and we can estimate the system, we estimate the risk assessment automatically for us, and we'll highlight which are the top risks for this product, like for instance, uh, the highest risk are the salmonella in black pepper and sesame seeds, and new risks, guess which is the ethylene oxide in sesame seeds. And the same analysis can be performed also for your suppliers. So you can add the suppliers with the ingredients that you are getting from them, and you can have, uh, you can have such a very good analysis. So, so yeah, so, sorry, yeah, can I just interrupt there? So on that piece there, if I gave a name of a supplier, not obviously on the webinar, but you could enter specific names of those suppliers and pull up individual data by supplier. Yes, this is a risk. That's correct. This is a risk that uh, is estimated based on the ingredients that the supplier is providing to you. If you go to the supplier evaluation module, you can use any name. You can search for the supplier and see if this supplier was uh, linked to an incident that was reported by national authorities. And the same can be done. You can save the name of all your suppliers and the system will continuously monitor the suppliers and will provide a risk assessment report for each supplier based on the food safety history of the suppliers. Something that is required by uh, national authorities like the FDA and that is required the foreign uh, supplier verification uh, actions to be put in place uh, by the companies that are sourcing ingredients from other regions. So this is something that can help very much to come. Yeah, I see, I see huge value in that for, for companies to, to search on their existing suppliers and also to search for future suppliers who you may be considering to use. Yeah? And the exactly. other point, I think, maybe I just another question. I don't know if Chris has a question, but the other point is about the, the amount of data that you're capturing in the in the platform. That's a huge amount of data, Yanis. How, how are you keeping it updated? How, how is that continually updated? So our system is continuously scanning uh, the very all the, the trusted and validated data sources. And this scanning is updated every few minutes. So every few minutes, we check for new incidents. Uh, we collect the new incidents. We process them. There is a, a team of human experts that is validating the information or that is validating that two announcements or even more announcements are uh, linked to the same product, to the same ingredient. So they are performing such a validation task in order to deliver the most accurate and updated information about food safety incidents uh, to the oh, So that's impressive because that's almost real time basically. You add in and update it all the time. This is the idea and it's the risk is also uh, real time. So you get the incidents but automatically you have uh, the risk uh, recalculated and the risk uh, ranking performed. So there, there are many expectations as we see from the poll about the risk prediction part. So what we are doing here is that we are applying the methodology that I mentioned uh, during the first part of my presentation in all the ingredients that are important for your supply chain. So for instance, if I'm using the first step is that the system has calculated, has used all the historical data to calculate the predictions for the incidents and hazards that may happen in these specific ingredients. So the first thing is that the system highlights to us which are the uh, ingredients for which we will have increased number of incidents. So for instance, for black pepper, for peanuts, in general for a category like cereals and bakery products, it is predicted that the incidents will go up that there will be increase in the incidence. So specifically for black pepper, if you click, you can see which is the increase of the incidence, the predicted increase of the incidence, how this prediction will go throughout the next 12 months. But the very important thing is that 
the system highlights to you which are the hazards that are likely to increase, how much it is anticipated that they will increase. So for instance, here we see that there is a focus in the problem of salmonella and also different serotypes for salmonella uh, that were identified. And the system also highlights to us which is the emerging hazard. So for instance, this specific uh, case of uh, serotype of salmonella is for the first time reported for black pepper. So it may be something that you are not expecting, but you need to take into consideration. Also, we are transferring these predicted hazards to the risk, to anticipated risk. So you can see the risk pattern here, which are the hazards at high risk region, which are a low or medium risk. So we see here how the risk look like, looks like now and how the risk will look like within the next 12 months. So there is an increase in the case of, of uh, salmonella. So this is highlighted. And this is also highlighted in the evolution of the risk where uh, the system anticipates that there will be approximately 10% increase in the risk for salmonella in black pepper. The system automatically having the knowledge of all the products and suppliers that are using salmonella, that are using black pepper, sorry, they will, it will highlight to us which are the affected product and suppliers. And it will also, and will also highlight which are other ingredients and products that will be affected uh, by salmonella and using all the knowledge and the history of the data that we have. And uh, if we go, for instance, it's also important to see predictions, even uh, in the case of ingredients that it is anticipated to have less uh, incidents in the future because uh, the incidents may be less, but we still may have some increasing hazards. So for instance, in the case of oranges that I'm sourcing from Turkey, I can see that uh, the hazards that are likely to increase is uh, the chlorpyrifos, methyl, but also prochrosar, as I mentioned in the case of mandarins. You can see again here how the pattern of the incident will change. So for instance, of the risk will change. So you see here that in the actual, right now, there's no hazard at a, a, a medium or high risk region. Whereas it is predicted that the uh, hazard that has to do with chlorpyrifos methyl will increase and will be at a medium risk. So this is something that uh, you can use as a very important information to take some measures and to design better your lab testing plan. Uh, again, sorry, for the case of chlorpyrifos, you can see how the risk will increase. And one very important part is that the predictions, when you are uh, sourcing for a specific region and the system knows about it. So here we have uh, oranges that I'm sourcing from Turkey. So we can also have predictions for the incidents from Turkey. So we, we know how the risk profile of the specific country uh, will increase or will be stable or will decrease. So it seems that it will decrease a bit, but still it will be at a higher level than uh, the last 12 months uh, for the case of oranges coming from Turkey. So we can, we can see there is no limitation about the predictions. Here you can see for uh, all the ingredients that you have, especially for those that uh, we have data and we have the history and the system, the predictions know uh, uh, how uh, can predict how the hazards or the risk will increase. Very happy to answer the question during the Q&A session or Neil, if you have any other questions. That, yeah, uh, maybe there's a couple of questions in the chat we can just try and answer as well now, Yanis. Uh, one is a simple one, uh, maybe if, no, it's not a simple question, but a question from Manfred. Does the Food Archive platform offer capability to issue automatic alerts to a user based on user defined set of criteria? For example, a new high risk hazard for ingredient from suppliers 
this would be very helpful for larger food manufacturers who have a large portfolio of ingredients and suppliers. So he's looking for an alert, automatic alert. Yes, the, the risk monitoring part uh, provides automatic alerts for any ingredient and any supplier that you have in your supply chain that was linked uh, to a specific incident, that was mentioned in a specific incident. So uh, you, you will get, in, it depends on the preferences that you will use in the customization, but you can get daily or even instant alerts every time that there is a problem with a supplier, or you can focus on specific uh, uh, hazards, on specific contaminants, uh, and add uh, alerts for the specific contaminants. So if you want only to see alerts for uh, fipronil, for instance, you can add uh, one uh, preference and get alerts only every time that there is a problem in bananas with fipronil for uh, peppers that uh, fipronil was found. It was, uh, was found, sorry. Cool, so I think that answers that perfectly, thank you. There's another question about sesame seeds uh, from the previous year were also high. What was driving this? Could the tool provide can't speak, predictions that the subsequent pesticide issue would occur? I think you had some data to look at the sesame seed prediction already, I think. Yeah, the, the sesame seed started, it was high in 2020 because it started in September 2020, was the first signal. Uh, but it uh, increased very much uh, until the end of the year. And this was predicted uh, because we identified the emerging risk and then the prediction algorithms predicted also the increasing uh, issues. So that's why in 2020, it was so high. It was accumulated for all the uh, months, September, October, no November, December. Uh, yeah, the idea is that uh, uh, we could, uh, how the predictions can also uh, predict uh, a pesticide that will affect uh, another ingredient. So uh, as we mentioned, Proclosal was mentioned initially uh, in mandarins, was reported for mandarins, but we also predicted that it will be affecting oranges because uh, the two ingredients are sourced from the two raw materials are sourced from the same region and they use as a practice in the cultivation they use this kind of uh, pesticide so this knowledge uh, is modeled in our system and this is uh, provided in the predictions cool thank you and the other i think one more just comment from the chat is does the food app app food Akai app uh, work on a mobile device or have you got an app yet? And I think that's maybe something you want to just mention, the future work. Yeah, yeah you, you can use it now from uh, tablets. It is available for, you, you can use it. The web-based version can be used by smaller screens, uh, but it's not, we don't have a native app. It's something that we are considering because we hear that it could be very helpful at an individual level to be able to follow uh, alerts and the main insights uh, or some very important emerging risks uh, to be available in a mobile app. So this is something that we will definitely uh, take into account for the next developments. Thank you so okay. much. So thank you, Yanis, for the demo. And obviously, thank you for Chris for the comments before. As you can see on screen now, uh, this, is, this is your opportunity to use the QR code to scan, uh, obviously to get further information from AgriNow about the different uh, solutions that they can offer, particularly if you're interested from what you see and you believe you can use the platform to help you to be more informed about predictive solutions. Uh, I'd encourage you to contact the team there to get some more information. So before we just now go into back uh, to, to summarize and maybe do a, a little Q&A with Chris and yourself, uh, I just want to summarize from what I think I've seen. So some very interesting insights as usual from Chris, uh, particularly around the human error, the risk of climate change and the impact on the food supply and, and his points around historical data uh, and the digital crystal ball that I'm going to try and steal off him as a, a new patent. But that's a, a good idea. Uh, insightful as always from Chris. 
and then the demo and the insights on uh, Food Akai that we've just seen from Yanis. Uh, always open to more questions and solutions, but please contact Anna and the team if you want more information. But maybe now just to try and wrap up in the last seven or eight minutes or so. So first of all, a question for, for you, Yanis. Just remind me again, I think you said it in the, in the uh, presentation, but how many different data sets and sources of data are you including in the platform? So we have, we are including many different types of data like uh, food recalls, border rejections, fraud cases and adulteration cases. I see a question about that. So we also include fraud and adulteration cases. Uh, we have data about uh, the, an information type, uh, data type that is uh, uh, linked to the uh, laboratory testing data. We have uh, country risk data that is used for the fraud reporting and adulteration, uh, predicting the adulteration cases. Uh, we have uh, sustainability data. We have uh, inspections uh, results that is presented in the food safety profile of each supplier. These are the inspection results that are the, the results of the inspections that are performed by the uh, different uh, governments, by the different na national authorities. And just to mention again, uh, we are collecting all the food safety incidents that are announced by more than 50 national authorities. Uh, we are collecting uh, lab test data from 34 countries. Uh, we, have, uh, we give access to more than 400,000 incidents historically, and these data are uh, increasing by 5% every month because we are collecting uh, almost in real time, new data, new incidents. We are integrating batch of new uh, laboratory testing results. So all this information is dynamic and it, it's continuously increasing. And the data coverage is uh, 196 countries. So it's a, a very high coverage in terms of origin of the ingredients and raw materials. Thank you, thank you, Yanis. So Chris, to you, to your favorite top, topic of food fraud, uh, how can these predictive tools and solutions be, be better used to help with the food fraud prevention? I think already, as Yana said, <clears throat> you're, you're doing some predictions around food fraud. And whenever myself and my research group, <clears throat> we start to look for potential issues, <clears throat> there's maybe different data sets that we would use <clears throat> that, that you currently use. So a lot is about uh, commodity prices, supply, demand, changes in consumers eating patterns. <clears throat> you know, if I give you an example at the moment, the sales of organic food is, has increased globally by about 20% <clears throat> during the pandemic period. And, and the question that I've asked lots of people, where did suddenly 20% more organic food <clears throat> suddenly come from? <laughs> no, but it's a fair question. <clears throat> so to me, that's my indicator of increased fraud in organic, and, and we will go and look at that. So I think the economic data is really important in terms of predicting fraud as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, could you also perhaps share, Chris, any thoughts or insights you may have on, you know, using your digital crystal ball again? What do you think is the next big issue that's around the corner that's coming towards us? If you had to put money on it, what would you say is the next one? Well, if we call 2020, you know, the year of the pandemic, 2021 is the year we're going to get out of the pandemic, but we are going to have massive issues in our food system caused by a lack of inspections, audits, um, I, I believe, you know, the sesame seed problems, you can track back to pandemic issues about the redirection of food from, from one country going into another country. So I think what we will see probably in the second half of 2021 
is a lot of the issues that have actually been happening during a lot of the harvesting storage of crops during the pandemic period. <clears throat> also, when you think about um, the number of cargo ships that have got stranded in different parts of the world, you know, <clears throat> will we have a lot more problems with, say, mycotoxins, for instance, <clears throat> in, in, in cereals and grains that should have been uh, transshipped and should have been a nice dry store somewhere. So I, I think probably over the next 12 months, we, we'll see a lot of issues arriving because of, of those massive issues that the pandemic has, has called. That, that would be really, in all honesty, when I look at my digital crystal ball, that's number one on my list. I think that's very useful, very insightful. Thank you as well, Chris. Um, I'm just checking the chat room now. I'm just checking our time. Um, don't see anything obvious well, in the question. If it's okay, I, I wouldn't mind asking actually Janice sure. a question Please. because you know I, I really like the the all of the data. Now very very soon I'm going to turn on my television. I'm going to listen to the news. And, and the thing that I will always listen to at the end of the news is a prediction. <clears throat> It's a weather prediction. What will the weather be like tomorrow, the day after, the day after? Now, I'm pretty sure if the TV tells me it's going to rain tomorrow, but it's going to rain tomorrow. But the further away you move from now, the less accurate that prediction will get. Now, I think in terms of the agrono data sets, have you gone back and looked about how accurate your predictions have been over short term, medium term, and long term? You know, because you know, they, they say a week is a long time in politics. Well, a week is even a longer time in the global food supply system. Things move so quickly, things change. So when you're when you're showing a prediction of six months or ten months, you know, how how reliable do you think that prediction really is? Great question, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to pass that one to you. That's your area. Oh, why? Why? <laughs> no, it's, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. And uh, it was one of the questions which uh, we will answer also after the, the webinar. Uh, so the answers will be provided by uh, regarding the accuracy. Uh, first of all, the way that we are selecting the best performing prediction algorithm is using the retrospective uh, validation results. So we have many candidate uh, algorithms that can be used, many candidate prediction methods. But doing this kind of validation, we select the one with the best accuracy uh, for the specific ingredient. So it's very specific to ingredient uh, because generic predictions will, are not working well. This is something that we have uh, tested. Uh, so this is how we have tested, which is the optimum amount of historical data to use, how uh, safe is to provide predictions for six of 12 months. So what you see on the system, the tw 20 years of history data and the 12 months of predictions is the ones, uh, the prediction algorithms that are performing the best uh, for the specific ingredients. So this is something that we do. We would not show something that uh, is not uh, accurate and tested before. Uh, and uh, regarding the, uh, the accuracy, uh, it's uh, more than 75% in general, but it depends on the specific ingredient. Something that uh, would be uh, very interesting is, that, interesting is that we can share, of course, this uh, data with uh, the customers and with the ones that are interested in the prediction. So this is something that uh, can be also presented to the users. Okay, thank you, Janis. And I think with the, with the time now, we're, we're actually at time. So being respectful, and as Chris needs to go and watch the uh, six o'clock news in the UK, <laughs> let's uh, end the call. Thank you, Janis. Thank you again, Chris. Thanks for a great demonstration and thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, the presentation will be shared or recorded afterwards. And thanks very much for your time. Thank you so much, Neil, for facilitating. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you very, very much. Good.
Thanks, Chris. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Bye-bye.